Bay Drive. I have Vim on camera. We have Kirsten and Louise in final control. And we have Jamie and Brian out on the other vehicle. So I'm just going to ask Vim now to have a look. We can see where the tracks are going. And after this rain, they're walking in some soft soil. So we should be able to see exactly where those tracks lead. And if anyone was paying attention a little bit earlier, there the lines are. So it's the Styx Pride. They've they managed to catch a sub-adult buffalo. And unfortunately, we did know where they were. We're just playing with you. We're just going to see if anyone spotted the lions off my right shoulder before we showed them to you. So unfortunately, they are just across uh, our southern boundary, but fortunately, a nice view. I haven't seen the Styx ladies in quite a long time, so quite nice to see they all look to be doing well. The one female, I'm not sure whether she's given birth yet or is about to. Uh, when she got up earlier, she had quite engorged nipples. And maybe, maybe there are some cubs around or cubs on the way shortly. And these will more than likely be, have been sired by the dominant coalition in the north at the moment, the Birmingham boys. And I say most likely because it's not always the case. And we will discuss that in a little bit of depth a little later. You can see only one lioness is still feeding. The majority of that buffalo has been engulfed quite quickly. It wasn't a particularly big buffalo. There she is. Nice full belly. Oh, looks like she's coming closer to us. And she might be just coming to lie down. Or, no, she looks like she might be coming, moving a little bit away from the carcass for, and to defecate or urinate. Or she might have heard something behind us. I'm trying to see no hyenas that I can see around. And she's looking an absolutely fine fettle. Hello, big girl. Oh, very, very, very nice of her to come right up to us. There she is. I think she's going to come plunk down, possibly right next to us, and wouldn't that be lovely? So, no vultures here today. Nice, cool day. The vultures haven't been able to get up and on those thermals and get up high to see if they can see anything. And, of course, this cool, rainy, windy weather is wonderful for the cats to hunt in. She's a very big lioness, this particular individual. Might be just doing a little perimeter check. You can actually just almost make out on the camera that there's a, a horde of little biting flies called stable flies buzzing around her. down in the cool sand of one of the busiest roads in the Sabi Sands, it looks like. Oh, there we go. Flop. Little grunt at the end there. Oh, so much effort. Well, there is quite a bit of rain about. We're getting spat on a little bit, but it looks like it's moved off us slightly uh, and pushed off a little bit to the west, so uh, we have got our rain covers in preparation, but I don't think we need them just yet. I'm just going to move forward a little bit so you guys can see a little bit more what's going on. So, from what I can see, it looks like the kill almost actually took place right here. During the rain, either sometime last night or this morning, and right next to us here, you can see the intestines have been buried. You can see there where the lions have dug up the sand and buried the intestines. And that's to try and mask the smell from other potential predators. There's the main stomach compartments, and that hasn't been opened. 
Uh, there has been attempts, if we come a bit wider there, Vim, and see how the lions have clawed and tried to kick sand over that. That's just, unfortunately, a bit big for them. And only having three ladies here, they haven't been too, too aggressive. I was trying to see, oh, she just turned her back now. And that female, one that I think might be about to pop with the bebe, has just rolled up. That is the one lying with her legs in the air. As she just rolled, I caught a glimpse of what looked to be very, very heavily engorged mammary glands. So, as I was saying, it looked like the kill happened almost right on the road, and they've dragged it off to where it is at the moment. Now, as a lion, you could not ask for more ideal weather to be fat and happy and eating. I'm just going to move forward a little bit so we can get a, a view of that lioness. Face, there we go. So even though that it's really cool, she's still panting really heavenly. So it's still trying to, the digestive process, creating heat. There's the kill there. We can't really see it too well from where we are. You can see a nice big hip bone. And I'm sure quite a lot of you are a little bit worried since we are on the southern boundary, which is known as Gauri, Maine. And Karula currently has her cubs stashed in a den very close to this road. And Michelle in New Jersey was the one who was very worried about that and was wondering whether these lions are close to Karula. So, Michelle, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Vim uh, to go straight down the road here with the, the camera and I'll try to pinpoint more or less, uh, where's my finger, where Karula's den is. It's about there. So on the eastern side of the Mawati drainage, probably over two kilometers in a straight line from where we are now. So happily for Karula, that's quite far away. It's a very interesting den site, uh, but while we're with the lions, I think we're just going to stick to lions for now. I will discuss Krula and her den site a little bit later on the safari, but let's stick to the big cats that we have with us. So, safari Dean's first time seeing the sticks. Well, congratulations, safari Dean. They are beautiful lionesses. I'm just going to try to see where we can get the best view for now. And we can see... I'm trying to see if we can get a nice little view of the... through that gap. And as I said, it was a young buffalo. Can we get through that hole there, Vim? Have I gone too far? I'm just trying to see that I've gone too far. If I come forward a little bit for you. You can see that heavy panting lioness. So if we go across to the kill, we can try to just see the heads just through there and very undeveloped horns. That's the ear. Unfortunately, we can't really see the horn from where we are here. So probably a buffalo calf from around two years old would be my guest. So guys, the rain is coming in at about to hit us so we will be back with the sticks lions and their buffalo banquet a little later them and i just need to move off a safe distance so we can pop the rain covers on uh, but we will see you back shortly and while we do that let's go across to jamie very good afternoon to all of you and what a wonderful way to start off a drive then with lions on a buffalo kill Brian and myself, on the other hand, have a wonderful journey of giraffe that are on the edge of the clearing there. I was just about to get you a slightly different view. But since we're here, we'll stop for now and just have a closer look. I believe that is our persistent suitor, a male giraffe that we've seen fairly regularly in the company of a female and her six-month-old calf that you can see just behind the male's back legs there. There's about five giraffe in total that I've counted. Could be more, 
So not quite reached our record number of nine in quarantine, but nevertheless, a lovely sight to start off our afternoon. There's a female there, very, very pale in color. You can actually see there's another low, low head. Now we always think of giraffe with their long necks as feeding on the tops of trees. Most of their behavior this afternoon has been leaning down and nibbling far lower, almost in line with their shoulders. Here's the little one at the back and its mom, all fairly light in color, which of course is a combination of genetics as well as age. But particularly with male giraffe, they start off their lives fairly light in color and then darken as they grow older. Now, the fascinating thing to watch a journey like this as they feed, and the fact that I know James touched on this a couple of days ago on one of the drives, the fact that the plants that they are feeding on, in order to reduce the impact that not just the giraffe will have, but any browsing animals, even an elephant or a nyala or a kudu, they will start to release a very bitter tasting tannin like substance into their leaves. Now, James mentioned it in the context of acacias, but I know that sickle bush, which is the round tree on your right, the sort of roundish crowned tree with the multiple stems, definitely know, also known as the flat tire tree, if you have bad luck. But I know that they will also release those tannins to stop the animals, any browser, from over-utilizing the plant. And those tannins will stick around for a little while. So as we watch this journey feed, you'll notice that they'll never walk back sort of in the direction that they've come from. And that's because they're picking the direction or they're working with the direction of the wind in their choices. Because not only will a tree release a tannin, but it'll also release a pheromone that will alert other trees surrounding it. And thus, as soon as that happens, the leaves become bitter around the tree, will become, of the other trees, will become bitter and unpalatable for the animals concerned. So they move if not downwind, then at least not direct, or they won't, they won't move directly downwind. And the alternative advantage of that, of course, is not just do they, not just do they manage to avoid the bitter tasting leaves, but also the fact that they will be able to smell any kind of a threat. So any browsing animal will walk into the wind or vaguely in the direction of into the wind in order to secure their safety and also to ensure that their afternoon tea is somewhat more palatable. Now they've moved across to the other side of quarantine. There's a nice two track there that runs close to where they are. I think that we should make our way across in that direction. We'll just have to do a little loop. Bear with us as we do and we'll catch up with them on that side and have a closer look and see which individuals in particular are with the group and see if we are right about our persistent, persistent Casanova. And what I mean by that is that there's been one male hanging around with a female in her car for a good few weeks. In fact, I would even say a good two months worth of time. And in the beginning, he was certainly showing a considerable amount of interest in mating with her. We never really discovered whether or not he was successful or not. He attempted many times with us viewing him, and every time she rejected his advances. It remains to be seen if he's managed to achieve his goal of the last two months of work that he's put in. Now Brent thinks that it is not going to rain, and you can forgive him when we look to the sky that we have ahead of us. I, on the other hand, thought that this morning and spent most of the morning fairly sodden, I think would be a good description. Dave looked a little bit like a drowned, I don't want to call him a drowned rat, that sounds hugely insulting and I don't mean it that way. He just looked a little bit bedraggled <laughs> by the time we managed to reach home. We were both feeling somewhat damp. I have a feeling that changing into a fresh, new, clean and dry uniform might have all been for naught this afternoon as the end of this cold front, I say cold front, it's not really that cold, but as the end of this rain front at least, slowly makes its way through. I feel as though I'm already being drizzled on, but I don't know if that's my imagination. Brian, Brian's nodding. 
There's a little bit of drizzle in the air. There is a moisture and a drop to the temperature that suggests that Brent perhaps might be mistaken. We shall see. I actually did race back to fetch my rain covers on the theory that if I didn't, it was going to pour down and that if I did, it wasn't going to rain. So we'll see what happens. No, it is rain in the air. I'm sure I can smell it. Some mizzle. Mizzle pouring down on us. A mixture of drist, drist, oh, bleh. drist and mizzle? Drist and mizzle, there we go. Some spoonerism in the afternoon. Hello, little monkeys. What you been up to? Mischief as always. This shy little troop that often hangs out in this area before we get to our giraffe. I can only see one. Oh, goodness, subtle, our subtle stop as he dashes up the apple leaf tree, pausing to peer back at us anxiously. What's up, monkey? I know that I'm certain that the rest of the troop is here. Oh, <laughs> somewhere. And the answer is yes. The rest of the troop has relaxed slightly, and there they are. Hello, baby, we see you peeking out from behind mommy. Yes. On the ground, foraging for seeds and fruits and roots. Oh, lunchtime. Lunchtime for little one. Picking the most in, there we go. Mommy shifting about to accommodate him. Another really nice start to the drive. Oh, look at the way she's investigating that baby. Dinner and bath time, or grooming time maybe is the better description. Using the sharp nails on her hands <laughs> to maneuver the baby, pulling up its arm to check the armpits for ticks. Something that I imagine my mom had to do when I was little, but maybe not with her mouth and maybe not consuming the ticks after she found them. Look at that, clearing around its elbow. And that grooming, of course, essential for little one's well-being. Yes, we're watching you, don't worry, it's okay. Essential for the little one's well-being, removing ticks and parasites, but also teaching it the basics of bonding and grooming that will serve it well as it grows older. All primates reaffirm, or at least these primates, reaffirm their bonds by grooming each other. Very often it is a show of subservience to groom another monkey. Well, Mom's decided she's not content with this open position to feed her baby. Maybe automatically that instinct to cling onto her belly is so, so strong. Even from a tender age of basically just being born, they immediately know, let's just have a look before I reposition. Let's just have a look at this monkey here. Is it damp or is that a scar? It looks like a scar to me along its back. Bald patches of fur. And it's also, it's got a little bit of a limp. I wonder, this, this monkey must have had some kind of narrow escape. If I had to throw a guess out there, I would hazard at the possibility of an escape from a bird of prey. They both get through. I don't want to really startle them. The engine run for a bit. And we'll just idle forward very slowly. I wonder as well if this is not Mom's previous youngster, judging by the position it's taken up. Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's all right. It's okay. Maybe a lucky escape. I'm going to speak softly, just so that I don't disturb them, but maybe a lucky escape from a raptor. It's not a fully grown monkey. You can see Mom on the left and then the youngster on the right. Maybe a previous offspring. Could well be. 
Well, there's lots of threats to monkeys out here. Big birds of prey, something like a martial eagle. Even a Barrow's eagle owl will tackle a monkey whilst they are thinking they are safely asleep in their trees that they've picked for the evening. Something itchy on his head. I love the way they grab it and then investigate it. Give it a really close look before popping it in their mouths. I want to see which tick has bitten me before I consume it. <laughs> look at that. Affection to the mother as well. Could be another member of the troop, but I would hazard a guess and say that it is mom's previous offspring. So an older sibling to the little one that's currently falling asleep whilst suckling, as babies are wont to do. Giving mom a good groom. And they do, they can reproduce at twice in a year, on a, in a good year. Carla, this is the only species of monkey that occurs within the Sabi sands is known as a vervet monkey. One of only two species of true monkeys that occurs within South Africa. The other is known as the Sykes, previously known as the Samango monkeys. And they occur more in forested regions. So these are vervet monkeys. The other large primate that we get are Chukma baboons. They are much, much larger. Here's another one hiding well spotted, Brian hiding beneath leaves, sheltered beneath the leaves of a sickle bush. Having a jolly good scratch of its tail. A lovely, lovely monkey sighting. Here comes mum to join the fray. Poor little baby just wants to have a meal and a nap. Mum keeps moving off. Imagine if you spend, if our babies, if our children were able to cling on like that, how much easier lives would be. Although we'd probably find ourselves with back problems. Where are you off to, Mommy? I'm going to go find a tree somewhere. And Safari Dean's absolutely right. This is a lovely sighting because we're getting to see them on the ground which actually doesn't occur that often. It is where they feel at their most vulnerable. There you can see mom decided she's not quite comfortable. She's going to go, I think she's going to go up a tree. The most common time that you will see them on the ground is when there are fruiting trees like marula trees or jackalberries. But when they do so, they are exceptionally alert and a little bit nervous, which is why I've approached the sighting so carefully. I think she's moved back a little bit behind the marula tree there. That's why I approached the sighting carefully. They don't feel as at home or as protected as they do. Obviously, it makes them exceptionally vulnerable to leopards. Once they're up in the thinner branches or the boughs of the tree, here we go. This is the monkey with the scar following behind. And even competing with a, we're competing with a monkey, a leopard in a tree just doesn't have quite the same agility and it takes an exceptionally skilled leopard to catch a monkey and an unlucky monkey at that from the boughs of a tree. But leopards are very good at surprising monkeys down on the ground. So that's why they are so nervous. It puts them at risk of all kinds of different predators, including possibly snakes, but mainly birds of prey and leopards. Speaking of animals of more the predators of the reserve. Let's find out what Brent's lions are up to. So, there is very little movement here. Some very f f happy, fat, full lions. So quite interesting how the, the, the lion's pride's territories have shifted over the last couple of months. Um, and we've seen the Nkuhumas not too far from here a few times, and we've seen very little of the sticks over the last, well, probably since November. 
even actually before November, we've seen very little of the sticks. But it seems like, to a degree, a lot of the, the pride territories have almost shifted back to where they were before the Birmingham takeover. And so the sticks are starting to come quite far north again, up towards the southern sections of Juma. The Nkuhumas still haven't quite got back to their normal part of the world, uh, which is very good for us. We're seeing a lot more of the Nkuhumas than we were in the past. They seem to have shifted a lot of their territory onto Juma, covering most of Juma now, and also a little bit further to the west into Arethusa and Sebambili. Traditionally, they used to spend a lot of time to the north in Buffalo's Hook. But now the Talamati pride seems to be spending more and more time in the area that was traditionally in Kahuma territory. And Talamati pride is getting quite big now. So five lionesses, but eight cubs. They also spend a lot of time with the Salati male lions. And since the Birminghams have ousted the Matimbas, the Birminghams don't really go into the north too much. They seem to stay in the east. So the Salatis have also started pushing quite a lot further into, into Buffalo's Hook than they were in the past. But that is one of the amazing things about being here constantly and having these live safaris every day. We can keep up to date uh, with the comings and goings and shifts and changes of all the different animals. Of course, it'd be nice to be able to see them every day, but then that would take half the fun out of finding them. Uh, Neil's wondering how did the sticks get their name? Neil, it's a very old name. As far as I know, the original sticks pride probably originates from the late 90s um, on Mala Mala. And if I remember correctly, it was someone who was being quite poetic and something to do with the river Styx uh, from Greek mythology. And they used to spend a lot of time around the Sand River, far to the south of where we are now. And they got quite big and then they split and split again. Now, I'm not 100% sure how many Styx lionesses are still out and about. I do know of these three. I think there could be a few others. And I mean, I used to see them many years ago, 2006. 2005, around there, uh, to the south, when I worked at Londolozzi. But then there were an impressive pride, I think were nine or ten adult lionesses in the pride at that time. Safari Dean has got quite an interesting question. Since we've been discussing the different pride movements, Safari Dean would like to know what would happen if the Nkuhumas happened upon the sticks here. Well, I think with only three sticks lionesses, I think the sticks would turn tail and try to get out of here. But you never know, with those five adults, the Nkuhumas would definitely have the upper hand at the moment. But I think more than likely, the sticks would probably try to get out of here as fast as possible. And especially with the numbers like that, they wouldn't definitely wouldn't want to risk an injury. So guys, these lions aren't doing too much. We'll definitely keep checking here, but it's up to you guys. It's your safari. So let me know via Twitter or email whether you would like to stay or go. So use the hashtag Safari Live or send us an email at questions at wildearth.tv. Should we stay with the sleeping cats a bit longer? Or should we go see what else we can find and then possibly come back? And while you decide, uh, Jamie's still with the journey. And really, truly, a magnificent specimen, this gentleman. Just look at that golden color and the posture, his upright stance, keeping an eye on us keeping an eye on all that's happening below him. He is a truly handsome male. Another difference for our giraffe fundies, most of you know by now, 
that the top of the ossicones rubbed clear of fur on males, whereas females are much thinner, or the ossicones or the horns much thinner than those of the male. Perfect, there we go, nice example. The female there with the thinner ossicones and the tufts of hair on top of them. But here's another difference I don't think you've looked at. Look at the muscle on his neck. Just look at the thickness of it. it. Gives him that incredible upright posture. He looks positively regal. There's something almost military in the way he holds himself up. But those neck muscles far more defined and bulging than those of a female. Because of, of course, he doesn't just need those neck muscles for lowering his head, but also for swinging his head around powerfully in a battle with another male, in a process known, oddly enough, as necking. The males swing their heads round and whack each other on the sides and on the rump and on the shoulders, but definitely far more defined than that of the female. And he, he truly is beautiful. The color, even in this grayish light coming through the clouds, is still extraordinary. So there's another difference between male and female giraffe. Now the height difference is heightened there, ha ha, because that is a calf that is on the right of him. It's the, looks like a six month old calf that is now very much accustomed to the presence. I think it's the same male. I'd have to see his back left leg. It's how I identify him. I'm fairly certain it is him though. Calf nibbling away. You can see how much growing it has to do to catch up. The female with its head lowered at the back as well. Little one, probably about, I'd guess, six months old. It was very, very new. Um, if it's the same one that we saw suckling on Aubrey's Road all those months ago with its umbilical cord showing, we'll put it at about five to six months of age still with that slight disproportionate look between its neck and its legs. Giraffe calves, of course, born with the shorter neck in comparison to their body size and longer legs compared to the adults so that they can keep up with their mothers but still be able to reach down and suckle without crucially lowering their head below the chest or the height of the chest. Watch that giraffe female at the back. Let's see how long she feeds with her head down at that level. She is on a slight slope, so it's not as low as it looks. But she, there you go, lifting that head up. I don't think she's going to feed for that long down, right down there. That's because it actually takes muscular work for a giraffe to lower its head to that extent. That thick tendon running all the way from the skull down the spine, and connecting to the shoulders there, she's up again. Also a very young giraffe. And since we've started the sighting, the females have been relaxed and feeding, and yet the whole time, a gentleman has been keeping an eye on us. It's all right, boy. I'm not coming to do you any harm. You can, you can eat if you want. Shaking the ox pickers away from his head. <laughs> They're obviously irritating him a little bit. Oh, little fight over the best spot to pick off ticks and, flea, ticks and fleas and parasites. <laughs> not enjoying their attentions terribly much. Now he's looking out across the plains and you have to wonder at what he is thinking. Funky Kauai was wondering, do the animals sense the rain before it happens? And yes, I suspect that they do. I think that they've got a far deeper perception and understanding of what's happening around them than we necessarily as humans do. I think we've largely, if not, I don't think we've lost those senses, but I certainly think we have learned to put them on the back burner and rely far more heavily on Google and the weather reports than we might otherwise if we were forced to live without such things. 
tortoises definitely do. You often see more tortoises out and about just before the rain. Occasionally you'll see more millipede activity as well. But I'm sure that applies to the macrofauna, so the larger animals as well. Things like elephants and giraffes, I'm sure are fairly good at predicting. If we could chat to them, they'd probably give us a more accurate weather report. The giraffe love this area. And I think a decision has been reached as to what Brent decides to do with the lions. So let's hop onto the back of his vehicle, find out what he wants to do, and I'll be back with you shortly. So as you can see, very little happening, but we just want to have a quick look at this female's stomach. So if we have a look, I don't think she's given birth yet, but definitely looks like she's possibly pregnant. As you can see, and the, uh, the mammary glands are quite quite well pronounced already compared to what they normally are. So we could have some babies in not too long. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But we have a verdict on should we stay or should we go with the lions and the verdict is we're going to move along and see what else we can see and then we'll probably head back here a little bit later hopefully they'll be a little bit more active we did have that fantastic view of that lioness walking straight up towards us as we started the sunset safari so toodles for now kitty cats we'll be back we were lucky enough uh, to spend some time with some little lion cubs and Amy is wondering ah uh, is this the same stick pride sticks pride that had three little cubs killed I think it was two cubs killed three cubs killed sorry you are correct there Amy by the Birmingham boys last year uh, it is the exact same sticks pride they have now succumbed to Birmingham uh, the Birmingham males, so as I said, it's more than likely that the Birmingham males have fathered uh, those, that pregnant female's cubs. However, a very interesting thing happens in lions and in quite a lot of lion populations. Up to about 50% of the cubs are actually not sired by the pride males or the dominant males in the area. Uh, there are nomadic males whose survival strategy and, or not survival strategy, their genetic passing on the strategy uh, is to sneak around and they will sneak around the peripheries and through these uh, coalition males areas and they'll mate with lionesses uh, when they get a chance and in certain areas up to 50 percent of the cubs born are born from those sneaky males and that's how they pass on their genetic code uh, without having uh, to fight uh, extensively for that right now, this quite often happens in an area like this where we often have very big male coalition, coalition so four or five lions. So in this particular case, if a, a male lion becomes independent on his own, for say, like uh, Junior from the Enkahumas, for example, uh, he might take this on as a strategy uh, to avoid confrontation unless he actually joins up with other young male lions and forms a, a coalition. So it's quite often these single males that haven't joined coalitions uh, are forced into that sort of sneaky male lion role to pass on their genetic code. Yeah, Viam, what should we look for next? Mvula. Mvula. <laughs> well, uh, Viam says we should look for Mvula, and I'm quite happy to tell you, Viam, we found Mvula. Viam, mm -hmm. we found Mvula. The... Ah, it's raining, so I've, I've already got VM's request answered. Then VM asked me to find Mvula, um, but mm. Mvula is the word for rain. I think VM was referring to the leopard, but I will take it as the rain. So I have tick, tick. You wanted lions, now you wanted Mvula. So I found Mvula. 
Tingana then. Ah, uh, okay, here we go. Now the other says we should go look for Tingana. I think we will do that. So just to, while we're chatting about Mvula and Tingana and other leopards, a quick update on what's happening with the other leopards. As you know, a shadow has presumed to have been given uh, to given birth on Arethusa. I spoke to De Beer, who's one of the head trackers at Arethusa, and they went to check on her uh, between drives today, and she's still in the same den site, so that whole area is still zoned. Someone did see her uh, driving down the main access road away from the den site in the middle of the day today, uh, but she was a little bit later already back at the den site. Now, Karula has got that den site on Gauri Main. Strangely enough, Shadow's den site is on one end of Gauri Main and Karula's is on the other. So the lions are literally in between the two different leopards that have cubs in this area at the moment. Now, Karula's chosen an unusual place uh, to keep her cubs, and that is in a stormwater drain underneath Gauri Main. Although she, I think she's probably moved them after the rain this morning. So that area, of course, is still completely zoned. So we will be avoiding that. If we do manage to find her while she's away from that area out hunting, we'll definitely follow her as it normal protocol applies then. And fingers crossed in about three to four weeks uh, when those cubs are a bit bigger and able to climb trees and that, and we'll, we'll be able to put one vehicle in there at a time and we can see some little cubbies. Yeah, I thought I saw a Tingana track there for VM. But alas, so while we continue to check for leopards and whatever else might appear, I'm hoping for some wild flowers. Uh, let's jump on board who's with Jamie, who's got a feathered friend. Now here is a wonderful bird known as a black-bellied bustard. And yes, you heard me right, busted with a U, busted. A relative of the Korhans and also the relative of the Kori busted, which is the heaviest flying bird in the world. Now, the reason I enjoy these particular birds so much is their incredible call. Generally, they only do it at the beginning of the day and around sunset. But maybe we'll be really, really lucky and this gentleman will give us a demonstration. Keeping my fingers crossed and sticking around in the hope that he might. You can see how the wind's picking up, ruffling his beautiful feathers. And the call of the black-bellied bustle there. Oh, goodness. Not even I can say it properly. The call of the black-bellied bustard is something akin to a whistle and then a short break, at which point he curls his neck up in preparation for the grand finale, which is a sound much like the popping of a champagne cork. Now, I do not even begin to attempt imitating it. It sounds ridiculous. Brian, I know, has done one or two good imitations before in his time. Mm. <laughs> Brian's <laughs> chuckling in the back. But I'm really hoping this gentleman might give us a good demonstration. He seems a little bit reluctant. He is incredibly exposed. He's sitting right on the top of a termite mound. And almost by that behavior alone, you can tell that it is a male. They are vaguely sexually dimorphic. The male's slightly more striking than the females. And while we sit and watch him, I'm just gonna try and find a nice picture for you so I can show you what I mean. Come on, boy. So hopeful. I'm also taking this opportunity to just listen for the herd of elephants that is reported to be in this area. Deborah, who is our armchair traveler, I agree with you. I also think they're very pretty, attractive birds. She's right, they do in a way, I can see what Deborah means, they sort of look, they actually look like baby ostriches. Baby ostriches don't take on quite the striking colors of the parents, particularly not the male ostrich, which is all black and white and incredible image that it presents. But 
the babies are much more, what's the word I'm looking for? Subtle. There's another word, oh, for goodness sake, brain. Amazingly, you have words on the tip of your tongue. Almost cryptically colored, I suppose you could say, as a way of camouflaging themselves in the brownish grasses. But I agree with Deborah, very attractive bird. He is right into the light, but I was too scared to go to the other side of him in case I frightened him away. Look at the underside of those feathers. As the, as the wings lift, you get to see the fluffy down underneath the primary and the secondary feathers that act as an insulating layer. It's cold up there in the skies. Although these guys are mostly ground birds. And since he's being fairly non-cooperative, have a look at the black behind his head. Has he got black all the way up his bit? Oh, he does, there you can see it. And James Taylor was wondering what it is they eat. There you can see the black strip all the way up underneath the chin. So that and the larger size is what distinguishes it from the red crested Corhan, just while he turns his head like that. But James Taylor, what do they eat? They are, can be actually fairly fearsome predators of insects. But they are fairly, what's the word? They're all round birds. They're very, very flexible in terms of their diet. Quarry bustards are capable of taking on even species of snake. Whereas a black bellied bustard would have to probably limit themselves to slightly smaller snake species. But there are a lot of small snake species around here. Not doesn't quite have the powerful bill of the quarry bustard. And I think you'll probably find that they'll also munch a little bit on seeds as well. There you can see how he's sitting on top of the termite mound. A large, very distinctive bird. Here we have the picture of the female and the male, and this is what I wanted to show you when I said we can almost see in terms of behavior that it is a male. The females generally don't put themselves on display, but they also don't have that very distinctive black belly that the male has, and they don't have that strip of black behind the eye. So actually exceptionally dimorphic little bird. And then the red crested Corhan, the bird that I was that I mentioned in relation to it. This is over here, the red crested Corhan. Slightly smaller and without the black extending all the way up underneath the chin. Also with its own distinctive whistling call, not quite as fascinating as that of the black-bellied bustard. And then since we're here and I have the book open, one last creature to show you. Let me just see if I can find it. No, I think it's going to be the other, the other side. That's what I was talking about, the quarry bustard. Something that we could see here, I'm sure some of you may have seen them on the live drives before. I haven't managed to put them on camera, have you, Brian? No. no. So they're more towards the open areas, but they are found within this region. We're just, just that fractional little bit too far to the east, but they could make their way around. You probably most likely find them around the Arethusa airstrip would be a good example. Or maybe even once Cheetah Plains becomes a reality, those lovely open clearings, the Gabbro clearings, I might be able to see something like that. That and secretary birds are definitely high up on our list of keeping our fingers crossed expectations. Now I'm on my lookout for the elephant herd that was reported, as I think is our black-bellied bustard. Now, apparently Brent has got a view of incoming rains. What did we say, Brian? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Let's jump on the back of his vehicle and have a look at the rains coming in. So, as you can see, well, where we're sitting now, we're getting quite a, a fine, steady drizzle. But what looks like that's coming in from the south is a little bit more serious. So I think Jamie must be in the, in the northwest or northeast, where I can actually see the sun shining. But down here in the south, there ain't no sunshine. And... 
we do need the rain, and I was hoping it was going to hold off till the end of the drive. But uh, we're going to keep going for now. But we can already see a lovely green carpet that sprung up. But I know it is unfortunate. We're right at the end of the growing season, so we're probably not going to get too much flush out of it. But every little bit will help as we go forward uh, to the, the actual dry season in winter. But I still think we're going to be in for an absolutely spectacular dry season in terms of game viewing, with droughts do produce incredible game viewing. So on VM's request, we're going to just be slowly checking very carefully around areas where Tingana has been known to pop up from time to time and said it's very possible he's here at the moment and we've missed the tracks with all the rain. So on yesterday's sunset safari, I popped a camera trap up and I left it there for the day as well today. So we're just gonna slowly make our way there. I'm gonna take it down and then unfortunately it takes a different card to my camera so I'll have, you'll have to wait till tomorrow to see what's on it. So Alura in Pennsylvania is asking for some giant land snails. After all the frogs yesterday, maybe we'll see some. I know James had one on the sunrise for you. I will keep my eyes peeled. This is... VM has spotted something. What are Warthogs. Mm -hmm. Well spotted, VM. Oh, there we go. Is that okay? Work. Here we go. A warthog with some piglets. And they're getting quite big already. Let me just try and go back a little bit. So they're going to pop through that window in the tree there. Oh. Through the window already. Well, we have seen a lot more warthog babies this year than I saw uh, last year. And the moms seem to be doing a lot better at raising them. There comes another little one. Incredibly cute little creatures. Now, we often see warthogs on their knees and their sort of elbows, for lack of a better word, is this very thick, developed pad. Did you hear that, Vian? Sorry, we're just listening. There's something very strange. What was that noise? It was the Ah, it was the brakes of the car. Okay, well, sorry about that. I just thought I heard something out of the ordinary. And that water dog obviously heard it as well because it's staring intently at us. But I was talking about the little pads on what we'd probably term their elbows. So obviously, they get very hard and stuff after they're born. But those pads actually start developing in utero. So those pads are really starting to thicken when they're still in their mom's womb. And of course, they spend quite a lot of time on their knees so they can dig up and get those roots and bulb systems from underneath. And all oh, these warties, they're going to move. Unfortunately, they're moving off into thicker bush, but we'll keep, keep chatting about them for a while. And they are fascinating. Ah, and see, I'll carry, carry on with the warthogs now. So Jamie, who wasn't sure it was going to rain and was very disbelieving of our claims, is now rushing to put on her rain covers. But now, the interesting thing I've noticed with warthogs over the last little while, we've often been seeing two big boars together. And that's going to change in the next month or two as they start sort of getting to their mating season. And warthog males have two very different strategies uh, of maintaining females. So the one is what you consider a more traditional. They will get a couple of females in an area that they live in and they will defend that uh, against other intruding males. And the other second way of 
attracting females and making sure they have mating rights is actually to defend a resource. So either good food um, or good water or an area that holds quite a lot of burrows. So they will defend a resource. So it's quite interesting. Most animals will either do one or the other uh, where here you have an animal that does both. So wildebeest, for example, will defend a resource. Those single bulls we see from time to time are defending a good grazing area that will bring females in. Zebra has the other strategy where it will actually move through and they don't actually hold the territory and they will defend uh, the females within their group. Now, a warthog does both, uh, depending on the individual male, which is very, very fascinating. So we're making our way towards Impala Plains at the moment, and we have seen Tingana in this area quite a few times, so it's going to be quite interesting to see what's there. If not, I'm hoping for some nice general game on that nice short grass, maybe some zebra or some wildebeest. So hi, Jack. Uh, Jack Wheeler is on Twitter, and Jack's just a little bit confused about what's happening with Karula. She says, why can't we go find Karula? Why can't we view the cubs? Uh, I'll just clarify that for you. So Jack, we could find her very easily. We know where the den is, but while those cubs are so young, we want to put as little pressure on her as possible. So we just stay away from that area. Uh, until those cubs are old enough to sort of climb trees and be fend for themselves. When they get to that age, Karula will actually leave them by themselves for quite a few days. So we do keep an eye on Karula and with the senior guides from Juma and whatnot, every now and then uh, we will go outside of the game drive time to just check up on everything, make sure that no one's going there firstly and also uh, to make sure that she hasn't moved the den site so we can move the area that's zoned. So what we do is, well, in the north here, they call it a negative lock. So a negative lock is fancy Sabi Sands terminology for you're not allowed to go there. So there'll be a discussion between senior guides. They'll go together, we'll go check. Uh, the last time we actually, it was um, Steph, uh, myself, and uh, Jamie, and then also Candace, the general manager of Juma. We just went to have a look. We stayed quite far away. We noted that she was still there, and then we moved off. So until those cubs are about two months old, and it all depends on, and different cubs are mature at different ranges, so it normally is around two months old. Uh, at two months old, we'll start viewing them regularly, but only one vehicle at a time, and, and then maybe only two vehicles per game drive. And so, and then once they get a little bit older, it obviously, that, that sighting becomes a little bit more open and we'll put, uh, It'll still stay as one vehicle for quite a long time, but you'll be able to have multiple vehicles that'll cycle through there. Now, the reason we do this is obviously to give Karula the best possible chance of bringing up those cubs to adulthood. And she is a fantastic mom, but you must realize bringing up cubs in the, the African bush. Oh, Viam, I thought you were in luck, but unfortunately not leopard tracks, just a hyena. Uh, in the African bush is a very difficult thing. So the average cub mortality, so the cubs that die before they get to a year old in the Sabi Sands is around 70 to 75%. So there's a very small margin for cubs that actually survive. And of the recorded cases of cub mortality, over 70% of them are actually killed by male leopards. So young male leopards, sort of like quarantine or conuma sort of age, not that are now semi-nomadic, they are not old enough to have their own fixed territory yet and are not mating. They are probably the biggest culprits at killing young leopard cubs. After that, your other predators, lion, hyenas, uh, and then there's always some very strange ones that kill leopard cubs. I know of python that have eaten leopard cubs. Uh, in certain cases, some of the big birds of prey like marshal or crowned eagle eat leopard cubs. Uh, baboons will kill leopard cubs. Buffalo will kill leopard cubs. But on average, it's normally uh, other leopards that will kill leopard cubs. But until those cubs are reached a nice good age where they're able to climb, bounce around, 
And with Karula, they're always going to be wonderfully relaxed clubs. And I hope that helps explain that a little bit better, Jack. So while we continue our search in the Western sectors, uh, we're going to pop on with Jamie, who's got one of the smaller inhabitants of the Sabi Sands. I was on my way to search for elephants, but I have found some of their biggest fans. And that is a dung beetle who has rolled a most impressive dung wall. Unfortunately, he hasn't yet managed to find a female, even with all of his hard work. So what he's doing, he's one of the species of dung beetle, and there are multiple species. There are lots and lots of different species of dung beetle. This particular type rolls a ball <laughs> finds a female and finds an appropriate place to dig into the soil. Luckily for him, the soil is nice and damp and soft, and he will be able to do that fairly easily. She will then lay her eggs in the center of that dung ball, and her grubs or the larvae of the dung next generation of dung beetles will be able to enjoy a, a meal at the very st start of their lives of dung. It's fascinating to watch them do this. They do it with their heads facing towards the ground, which makes, as you can imagine, for exceptionally difficult navigating. And every now and again, he'll stop his rolling activities and jump onto the top and have a brief look around, orientate himself, although he seems to be on a roll. Whoops, ooh, ooh, slight wobble, speed wobble. It's all going so well. I, I would love to know how they choose exactly how far they go and where exactly they deem as it appropriate to stop. Now, when we first stopped at this particular sighting, there was another dung beetle who is just going off the road there, there we go, who was frantically chasing our dung rolling beetle down the road. And I suspect, and dung beetles all do this, which I think he was trying to attempt to steal it. Or might have been the other way around. This poor dung beetle might have been the individual to put in all the work of rolling together the wildebeest dung that that dung ball is constructed out of, only to discover, oh, he's on, he's had it. He's off. Amazing with all of the evolution, well done, Brian, all of the evolution that goes into, sure. Brian, that was incredible. Here he goes, off down the road. I was about to say, with all of the evolution that goes into the construction and design of dung beetles, they still haven't managed to adapt themselves to an easy landing. And no matter where you are, or what pile of dung it is they have discovered, you will observe dung beetles come crash landing in. That and they've evolved to roll the dung ball down the road with their head facing downwards towards the ground fascinates me. I happen to know personally somebody who won the Ig Nobel rather than the Nobel Prize, the Ig Nobel Prize, for working out exactly how dung beetles navigate in terms of gravity and the pull and the light of the moon, which is fascinating. I'll have to read up on it before I give you the full details because I don't want to give you misinformation, and I don't remember the full details of his paper. There he goes. Just while we've been watching, he's covered a distance of about 20-odd metres. Here he goes, off into the distance. Well done, little dung beetle. And as he heads on his way, Brent has found another little animal of the bush for you to look at. So, from one little animal, that has a lot to do with dung to another little animal that has a lot to do with dung. So here we have a scrub hare having a scratch on the chin. They're so cute. Oh, their noses are always on the go. Little lick. He's maybe sitting up a bit early because of the cool overcast weather. You can see those massive eyes designed for nocturnal movement and those massive ears to hear any potential predators. And as I said, from the dung beetle, it's even named after a dung to the scrub hare, 
who eats his own dung. So a scrub here is not a ruminant, it is a rodent, and they will eat their own dung up to seven times to get the maximum amount of nutrients out of it. Oof, oof, all this wet weather. I've got to keep myself clean. Quite a nice little preening going on. Unfortunately, he is quite well hidden in a little thicket there, so sometimes we'll lose view. But I've got a question for you guys out there. So I've told you that he eats his own feces. Now, there's a, a nice big scientific word for that, and I'm wondering if anyone knows what that the correct terminology is for an animal that eats feces, or specifically eats its own feces. If you know, you can pop me an email at questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So you can see he's cleaning himself quite a lot at the moment. And that is probably due to the wet weather, trying to keep himself nice and clean. You can see he's got himself into a wonderful little thicket. And there's probably not a good chance of one of the predatory birds spotting him from above. And there we go. Now, oh, try to get rid of those fleas and ticks. Now, these little guys have inc incredibly sharp little claws um, that you can actually see in their tracks when they run. And to help them with traction when they're trying to escape from potential predators. Look at that. Really giving himself a good clean. So it's not a rabbit, it's a hare. And rabbits and hares are quite different, and specifically in terms of how they have their babies. So a rabbit gives birth under the ground in a warren, and the babies are born very similar to what a predator's babies are born. Very little hair, eyes closed, completely helpless. And it takes them quite a while to get bigger and stronger before they come out with the adults. A hare has the complete opposite strategy, and it's very much like an impala would be. Uh, the babies are miniature versions of the adults, and they're able to run within minutes of birth. So a hare's baby and an impala's baby, for example, is a term called precocial, obviously based off precocious. And a rabbit's baby or a leopard's baby is altricial, meaning it needs care and looking after. So a human being as well would be altricial, and a zebra would be precocial. So I hope that, oh, it looks like he's finished cleaning. I have one last look at this little ball of fluff. He seems to be listening. I hope he's been taking notes, and he now knows that he is precocial. So well done to David, Debbie, and Maya. Uh, copophagia or po copophagy um, is, or coprophagy, depending on your pronunciation, is the correct term uh, for an animal that eats feces. So while we leave this little guy, and we're going to move on, and we're going to be looking for James at the moment because the James has my spotlight. So Lou DeLion says that's recycling taking a little bit too far in terms of feces eating. Well, maybe all of us could learn something about recycling from the, the humble scrub hair. We keep trying to run from the rain, it keeps following us, but we are trying to keep further and further to the west uh, as the rain rolls in from the south and east to try to stay out as long as possible. Sorry, guys. Well, 
while I try to find James. Uh, Jamie's got a far more interesting animal than James, so let's go have a look what it is. I did actually find James myself, and he let me know about this elephant herd wandering straight across main axis. Hello, little one. Oh, I love the way they do that road crossing. It's that little, that little dash. Hello, beautiful. You big boy. You're a lovely bull. A gentle elephant sighting in the rain. Doesn't really get better than that. Well, that rapid little walk that they do across the road. And Geraldine was wondering, Geraldine watching at the amazing distance of probably about two kilometers from a final control, wanted to know why they do that rapid walk across the road. It's specifically the little ones, first of all, because it's a bit of a slope for them. So they build up a bit of momentum going downwards. And also because they feel slightly exposed, particularly when separated from the rest of the herd. They like to do a fast jog to catch up with them. It's generally the, oh, what happened there, girl? Something irritating you. I like to do a rapid movement across. Now, when I bumped into James about two seconds earlier, he mentioned that this at, at half trunks herd was with the rest of these elephants. I think she must have moved off into the dense bush. We do have this lovely older female. Look at the way she's sunken in around her temples. Hello, big girl. Aren't you gorgeous? Hmm? We really have been spoilt with some phenomenal elephant sightings over the past few days. Really special. She's got nice thick tusks for a lady. This little one hasn't quite got there yet. And the trunk coordination, as we've said before, takes a few years to perfect. Now, even at this age, which is probably about, I don't know, two years old or so, they haven't quite got it down to the same way that the females do. Kicking things over, on the other hand, definitely going well for this little one. What are you after? It's it got hold of a baboon's tail plant that I think has already been stepped on by mum and is now investigating it thoroughly. Mm, not worth it, eh? Not quite worth the effort involved. Oh, there's, there's a sibling or an older cousin. Time to say hello. Stepping over the thorn bush. It's not that easy when your legs are about half the size of everybody else's and you've got things with thorns to navigate. It doesn't quite come as second nature. Unfortunately, they are going to move into a very dense bush. And I'm not going to follow them once they do disappear, just because the noise will upset them. As I said, the elephants are disappearing into the bush. Bauti or Booty, I apologize if I have mangled your name. I'm not quite sure, so correct me if I'm wrong in pronouncing it. I imagine that it's Bauti, who is watching in Romania, wanted to know what is the difference between forest and bush, since the, we, they both seem to have trees in them. A very poignant op or very valid observation. Bush is slightly less dense than forest, and the species of tree tends to be different as well. So a forested area you'd barely be able to see into, whereas bush is actually known for its delicate balance between the grass layer and the tree layer. So we would describe this particular ecosystem, the, the description of this general vegetation type, as mixed bush-willow woodland would probably be the best description for it. 
In other words, the predominant species are bush willow species intermingled with raisin bushes and various other tree species. So it's not as dense and there's that very, very delicate, delicate balance between the grass layer and the tree layer that qualifies this as bush or savanna is the larger biome that it, is, that it falls under. A forest is a denser vegetation. There's less dependence on the grass layer and is more dominated by the presence of trees and also the types of trees as well. Generally, our typical idea of forest is that it is evergreen, which isn't always the case in South Africa. We do have areas that qualify as forests, but they are much smaller than our savanna areas and more found along the ridges of the Drakensberg Mountains or down towards the coastal areas. Brent is behind me saying, beep, beep. <laughs> like to come past or something? Beep, beep. beep, beep. I see you found your rain covers. <laughs> Let's um, allow Brent to come past before he pushes us out of the way. Oh, onto the bank. Hi. Hello. Great minds think alike in terms of area. So literally, Bam and I have been running from the rain. You've been running from the rain. We've now got to the point where we've got nowhere left to run. VM, that is an extraordinary poncho. I'm not even sure if it's the hard way around. <laughs> I don't think it matters. <laughs> Although, I, it looks as though the hood might sort of sit over your eyes. Yeah, I think this is actually the best. I want to go. <laughs> Fair enough. I can't talk. I look a little bit like I'm wearing a sail. He's himself a nice puddle under his chin. <laughs> he can have a drink of water as he goes. We're going to go collect my camera trap and then uh, back to Okay, enjoy. Bye. Don't get too damp. <laughs> the elephants, of course, now are moving. And we've got one or two grey bottoms disappearing behind the leaves. Beam's poncho looks incredible. It's like he has a little water trough. Gracie, it's an absolute pleasure. Gracie, who is eight years old, is watching our show. And Gracie says that she enjoys the fact that we find her elephants on the bad days. Gracie, it's always a pleasure. And as always, it's lovely to have you watching our show. I'm sorry that our Ellies have moved into such dense vegetation, but I'm sure there will be more around. I'm actually fairly certain that I saw a bull earlier, but he hasn't decided to pop out just yet. And just after we had that black-bellied busted sighting, an elephant walked straight across the road in front of us and after this breeding herd. Unfortunately, I think that might spell the end of our elephant herd sighting. Luckily, we got there when we did. Otherwise, we might have just missed them. It's always nice to get that timing right. But before we disappear off, Lael, who's watching in Washington, since we always see elephants drink with their trunk, Lael was wondering, can baby elephants nurse with them? And the answer is no, they don't. They nurse with their mouths. One of the biggest reasons behind that is because they can't actually, they're not actually capable of forming the suction that they need to around the nipple with their trunks, but they are, of course, with their mouths. So they can't, they don't actually suck with their trunks and then put it into their mouths in the same way that they drink water up. Drinking water is a little bit different from suckling. You know, you just sort of stick your nose in or stick the trunk in and suck up and then put it in, transfer it into their mouths. Now, interestingly enough, with most of the animals around here, with this steady rain that we've been experiencing, they are able to drink from the puddles around them. And it's not the same with elephants. First of all, it, with a big herd like that, where each elephant is capi capable of, if it's a large elephant, sucking up about 12 liters into their nose in one go and drinking that down. So a puddle is going to disappear very quickly. But also they're quite fussy drinkers. They don't really like their water mixed with mud. Even when they dig holes and get water up from underground, they'll allow it to settle first. They allow the mud to settle to the bottom first before they drink from it. That's why when you often see them, they, when they come to drink and they're not hugely thirsty, they touch their trunk to the water 
and then sort of pick some up and then spray it at the surface, which is just to clear the dirt and the muck away. Uh, fussy drinkers are elephants. And at this particular moment, camera shy as well. I feel a little bit as though if I don't drive backwards off the slope, we could slide. Oh, there we go. So this is why we are very careful about driving off-road at the moment. Just have a look at the impact that I've done to the side wall there, just in this rainy time. And already, it started to make a mark. And that's why we are not pushing it any further in terms of off-roading where we don't need to. Oh, here comes the rain. <coughs> How's it, guys? Good afternoon. Hi, oh, Mike. How are you? Um, sorry? Yeah, and Glove have just gone straight north into this block. Hi, guys. Hi. Yeah. Here it comes. Yeah. Damp for the second time. Yeah. Cheers, guys. discussing with one of the new Cheetah Plains guides. I'm attempting to shelter my mic beneath my jacket. I'm also... At... Oh, yes, sorry. Brian desperately gesticulating. He would like the rain cover part known sometimes as the apron, sometimes as the skirt. Um, all times ridiculous, but it does work in a way of channeling our water down to the parts that don't matter if they get damp. While we do that, let's jump on the back of Brent's vehicle. So the rain has stepped up quite a bit and there's a lot more coming. So we're going to just collect the camera trap quickly. Unfortunately, the lions are way down on the south and I don't think we're going to be able to, to get there in this weather without compromising the equipment. Oh. That wasn't very clever, was it, Vian? I went a bit too far. <laughs> oh, misjudgment there. Let's just go forward a scratch. So, very exciting. If we do find anything on this camera trap, I'll be sure to post it. It's got video and photo on, so hopefully we might catch something we don't get to see normally on the the drives, you turn it off so it stops taking pictures of us. There you go. Have a quick look, see how many pictures it took. Ooh, 124. Uh, I wonder how many of those are people driving past. Speaking of people driving past, I told them the rain was coming, but he didn't listen. Look at him. It's Ninja Bond. It's Ninja Bond in his ninja gear, running yeah, from the rain. Are you, are you still going in this bad weather? Uh, we're about to. I think uh, we're waiting for him to say the camera's going to break. Yes, I got very wet, everyone. Can you see? Is there more coming? Yes, lots. All right, there when we go. the time when you pack it in comes. When your underpants have become wet, it is then time to go home. <laughs> Have a good so James is coming from the direction the weather is coming from. So I'm just gonna ask Vim what he wants to do. He's the boss when it comes to these things. There you go. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Vim says, unfortunately, we have to call it. Uh, we're getting wet, but we're, we're, we're waterproof to a degree. Unfortunately, the cameras and everything else is not. So uh, it's been great. We will stand by. Hopefully, it doesn't, or it does stop for a little bit. But I'm going to get them to show you quickly. There seems to be a bigger white wall approaching us. And I think that's what James has just come out of. So that is all, that white haze you're seeing is all rain. So thanks for joining us on a, on a wet but shortened sunset safari. And it is great because we really need the rain. The animals need the rain to get through the long dry season. So don't forget to join us uh, on tomorrow's sunrise safari. Uh, and hopefully we'll be a little bit drier than we are at the moment.